Now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one whom by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned, and if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of this world is passing away. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. Well, this is the word of the Lord. Would you pray with me as we begin? Heavenly Father, what a privilege it is to carry all things to you in prayer, to know that as we come to you this morning, even now in this very moment, that you welcome us to come to you. Lord, there are a thousand burdens in this place this morning. You see them all, you know them all. And Lord, you are inviting us to place those burdens in your hands. As Father, as we come to this section of Scripture, we just ask that you would teach us. Would you shape us and mold us? We are prone to to want to be the ones in charge and stand in authority over everyone and everything, and we can take that approach to your word this morning. And so, Lord, we just recognize that and confess that. And we just, um, Lord, we proclaim that we believe that you are the one in charge, that your word is authoritative, and Lord, we want to submit to it. So would you help us in that today? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I wonder if you've ever gone through a sudden relationship change. It can be very rocky. It can be kind of jarring to all of a sudden have a relationship that used to look one way, all of a sudden change to look completely different. All of us have probably experienced this in some way or another. Maybe for some of you, you've gone through a breakup at some point in your life, and with the relationship that you knew that you thought was great, all of a sudden, in a moment, now looks different, and you've got to navigate how do I operate here? This relationship has totally changed. Or maybe you've been in a, a long-standing relationship with a friend, and, some, and that friend has hurt you in some way. And now you know, you both know, your relationship can never really look the same because you've walked through something really hurtful and really painful. Maybe for some of you, it's been moving. You used to be physically close to somebody, geographically close, and now you've moved, and now that there's this distance and separation, you have to figure out, What does our relationship look like? Maybe for some of you, you've you've experienced marriage. Marriage being like, all of a sudden, I used to just be friends with you. I used to just be dating you, and now I'm with you all the time. I can't escape you. You see everything about me. Well, how do we do this thing? Sudden relationship changes can be difficult. They never tend to be smooth. There's always an adjustment period of figuring out how do we relate The people that are receiving this letter, particularly within this section, they were Christians in the city of Corinth, the ancient city of Corinth, and they were going through a relationship change with almost everything in their world. They were going through basically a relationship change with the world. They had become Christians. They weren't Christians before. This man, Paul, that wrote this letter came to the city of Corinth, told people about Jesus, said that Jesus came to earth God took on human flesh, lived a perfect life, died on the cross for your sins, rose again, and if you believe in him, if you follow him, you can belong to the Lord, you can be saved, you can have eternal life, and people believed. And because they believed, it meant everything about their relationship with the world suddenly changed in a moment. Everything changed. 
And yet, so much of their lives didn't change. They still had their jobs. They still had their friends. They still had their marriages. They still had their financial debt. They still had all of these things that they had in their life before they became a Christian. They still have all of those things, even though their whole identity has changed. They've become a Christian now, so everything's changed. Their eternity's changed, and yet so much hasn't changed. And so the question for them is, well, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to live doing all of these things that are just a part of our lives, but everything about us has changed? What do we do? Do we need to change all of our circumstances? And so they're, they're, they're wondering this. They're, they're asking this. How do we go about living in this world as a Christian? And Paul, in this section that he's writing, is specifically going to focus on the return of Christ. That one day Jesus is coming again to establish his kingdom fully and forever. And he starts focusing on the return of Christ as having a direct implication on our present lives. Because when you come to Christ and become a Christian, you are caught up in this massive story. You are caught up in a present and yet future kingdom that is to come. This whole letter started with this phrase describing Christians that we are awaiting the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is so much of what it means to be a Christian is we are following Jesus with our lives and yet we are eagerly awaiting for the revealing of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are eagerly awaiting for all of creation to see and know the Lord Jesus as he is. The one and only God, the one that reigns over everyone and everything, the one who holds all things together, the only Savior, the only hope. We're awaiting that. And so we're caught up in something that is both present and future. And in this section, addressing this question, how do we live now as Christians? He's saying we live precisely informed by the future. And he looks to the return of Christ and says that because Christ is coming again, our relationship with the world must change right now. Being a Christian is not just something for after you die and go to heaven. Because Christ is coming again, our relationship with the world must change. And yet, many of us live as if nothing needs to change. Just my after-death destination has changed and many of us feel the pressure of living in a world that does not know Jesus, that does not love him, that is in opposition against him. And for many of us, if we are honest, we feel this pressure to just kind of try to slide in, fit in, and not stand out. Except when we come to this passage today, we see our lives have to look different. Everything needs to change. How we use our time, how we invest our cares, and how we devote our affections. So look with me at verse 25, where Paul is going to show us that because Christ is coming again, we must change how we use our time. We must change how we use our time. Look at where he goes here in verses 25 through, 20, through 29. He's continuing this discussion that I mentioned earlier. He's talking about singleness and marriage. He he initially begins by talking to the betrothed. If you have a different version than the one I'm reading, yours might say virgins. He's speaking to those that have not married and therefore have not had sex together. That is kind of the, the general assumption here that if you were not married, you were still a virgin. Now that might not particularly play in our culture, but it was kind of the assumed reality here. So he's addressing those primarily, probably those that are female virgins. But the instruction that he gives applies to both men and women that are not, that are not married yet. So the word betrothed is somewhat of an, uh, kind of getting into the, we don't wanna, I don't want to get into the weeds here, but it's essentially an, interpretative, uh, an interpretation decision to say, well, most of the instruction that follows here addresses both male and female, so let's use a word that encompasses both. So he's talking to those that are not married, that maybe are soon to be married, and how are they to live their lives? How are they to use their time? And he's going to give them some pastoral perspective on their present situation. But in verse 26, look at what it says. It says, I think in view of the present distress, it's good for a person to remain as he is. So speaking to singles, essentially saying, in light of the present distress, I think it's good for you to remain single. What is the present 
distress. We don't know entirely from this, but we do know from some outside sources that uh, it's most likely there was some kind of severe famine happening in this part of the world at, this time, at the time of this letter. And so this present distress that he's referring to might be a famine. We, that feels kind of foreign to us, so maybe we can just think about it. Through the present distress all of us have just walked through and are currently maybe still walking through, like a pandemic, right? There's a present distress happening to this community. They are stressed. They are burdened. It is difficult. On top of the difficulty of a famine, there are also Christians who don't fit into a culture. And so Paul is saying to them, right out the gate here, he's saying, it's probably best if you don't get married. Precisely because it would be an extra burden on you in a season of already being burdened. Your time is going to be filled with more burdens by pursuing marriage. Now, Paul's not anti-marriage. Let me just say it out the gate. We've talked about marriage a little bit through 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We'll talk about it a little bit more uh, next week. Paul's not anti-marriage. He holds it up as a beautiful picture, God-ordained. But he's saying here, in the light of the present distress, I think pastorally it's good for you to not take on more burdens that are going to fill more of your time with more stress and more burden and more anxiety. Then he throws in this caveat to say, but at the same time, it's not sinful to get married. I appreciate that from Paul. But here's what he's keying in on. This condition of ours as human beings, that our time is limited and we are very susceptible to wasting it. We are very susceptible to being burdened with things that are less important than following Christ. All of us are susceptible to that. All of us, I would venture to guess, in the culture we live in, are burdened with busyness. We are burdened with busyness. Many of us are regularly taking on more burdens, more responsibilities, filling our calendars with more events, never missing anything, because if I'm available, I have to go to it. Taking on more responsibility, more side jobs, more pursuits, more goals, We are very susceptible as a culture, as a people, to be burdened with just being busy. For many of us, we've come to attach ourselves to busyness because it's a status symbol. You know, culturally, leisure used to be a a status symbol. If you could just rest and relax and everybody else do everything for you, that was status. In our day, it's busyness. Busyness is status. If I'm always busy, it means I'm important. I'm always in demand. People want to be with me. People want to hire me. People want to use me. I have status because I'm busy. We believe that. It's a lie, but we believe that. If we tell others we're always grinding, it never stops, I'll sleep when I'm dead, these kinds of narratives that just work their way into our minds, being busy means I'm important, means I matter. It's a sign of productivity. Oh, what did you do today? What did you accomplish? Can you point to something that you accomplished with your day? Even in our leisure, we are tempted to be busy. When you have a day off or you have a vacation, there's this angst in us that says, I gotta get something done. I have to show something for the time that I have. In our leisure, I gotta binge a whole season of the newest show or else I wasted my time. I wasted my leisure by not being productive. We are addicted to busyness. For some of us, it's just a time filler. We just don't know what to do with our time. For some of us, it's this angst of, I don't want to miss out. I don't want to miss out on all the things going on, so I just got to say yes to everything and just be busy all of the time. And yet, for the rest of us, busyness can also be a form of escape. I heard this said once, busyness becomes our existential comfort pill the refuge from existential angst. If I don't want to slow down and be alone with all of the big thoughts about what am I doing with my life, what is my purpose? Well, if I'm just busy, I'll never have to think about those things. This fictional story was told one time about Satan calling a worldwide convention. And in his opening address to all of his demons, he says to them, Listen, we can't keep Christians from going to church. Now, this, you can tell this is an old uh, illustration because 
many Christians don't go to church today, right? But he says this to his demons. He says, we can't keep Christians from going to church. We can't keep them from believing the stuff that the Bible says. We, we can't keep them from these biblical values, but we can do something else. And this is what I want you all to do. Distract them. And to which one of the demons jumps up and answer, asks and says, well, how are we to do that? And Satan replies and he says, keep them busy. Keep them busy with the non-essentials of life and invest unnumbered schemes to occupy their minds. Tempt them to spend, 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 and then borrow, borrow, borrow. Convince them to work six or seven days a week, 10 to 12 hours a day so that they can afford their lifestyles. Keep them from spending time with their children. As their families fragment, soon their homes will offer no escape from the pressures of work. Overstimulate their minds so they cannot hear God's voice. Entice them to play radio and podcasts and music wherever they drive. Keep the TV, the radio constantly going in their homes. Fill their coffee tables with magazines and newspapers. Pound their minds with news 24 hours a day. Invade their driving moments with billboards. Flood their mailboxes and email with junk, sweepstakes, and every kind of newsletter and promotion. Even in their recreation, let them be excessive. Have them return from their holidays exhausted, disquieted, and unprepared for the coming week. And when they gather for spiritual fellowship, involve them in gossip and small talk so they leave with souls unfulfilled. Let them be involved in their evangelism, but crowd their lives with so many good causes that they have no time to seek power from Christ. Soon, they'll be working in their own strength, sacrificing their health and family unity for the good of the cause. We are addicted to busyness. You may have heard that phrase, um, idle, idle hands are a devil's playground. Well, if that's true, then this is also true. The busy hands are a devil's laser pointer. Ever been in a room where somebody has a laser pointer? Everyone watches it wherever it goes. <laughs> busy hands are the devil's laser pointer. Busyness. I'll be honest for a moment. Some Christians are too busy for Jesus. Some Christians are too busy for Jesus. We've so crowded our schedules and our lives, not with bad things, with good things, but we've so crowded and scheduled our lives that it seems ridiculous to carve out one morning every week that we can commit ourselves to to be with Jesus and be with his people. We tend to think, I can go to church on Sundays and gather with God's people as long as I don't have anything else going on. As long as I didn't have a late night on Saturday. Some of us are too busy for Jesus. Jesus is always ready always open arms to meet with us, to dwell with us, to speak with us, and yet we say, man, Jesus, I'll read my Bible and spend time with you in the morning if I have time. As long as I don't have too much work to get to. As long as I can work out first. Can you imagine if the Lord approached a relationship with us like that? If we had a, a, a standing time with him, just say, Lord, I've just set aside this time to commune with you, Jesus. And we show up, and he says, well, he's just not there. He had a, he had a really important dinner on Saturday night and just kind of stayed out late and just thought he'd sleep in a little bit and, and, and catch it on YouTube. We're too busy for Jesus. We're just busy. We just have stuff that's filled our calendars. And yet Paul says this, verse 29, the appointed time has grown very short. The appointed time has grown very short. He begins that in verse 29 by saying, this is what I mean, which is, let me translate that for us. He's essentially saying, I mean this. I mean this when I say this. The appointed time has grown very short. 
He's referencing the return of Christ. The fact that Christ is coming back, it has compressed the time. He's not so much concerned with the duration of the time, but with the, the, the character of the time. Not, not necessarily about how little time is left, but about how Christ's return has changed how we look at the time that's left. That those who know we have a definite future and we can see it clearly will live in the present with a radically altered value system on what matters. You ever had that experience of climbing um, like a mountaintop or going to a rooftop and just kind of observing the view? It's incredible to just like, you get a little bit of elevation and you can see so far. Things that, fe- that fe- feel so far away when you're on ground level, you get a little bit of elevation, and it's as if the distances have shortened. You know what I'm talking about? You've experienced that before? Christians, it is like we stand on a mountaintop. We can see where things are headed. We can see the end of human history. We know the culmination of all things is that Jesus Christ will return, and he will reveal his glory. And because we stand from that vantage point, we know it's not that far off. The distance is actually a lot shorter. It's more compressed. And because we have that view, it means how we use our time has to be different. The value we place on it has to be different. Hear me. Busyness in and of itself is not bad. It's not. The author writing this letter Paul was very busy. He was traveling everywhere all the time. But he was busy with things that the Lord called him to. He was available to the Lord to change those if the Lord called him to change. But we're susceptible to just absolutely wasting our time with things that ultimately don't matter all that much. So because we know the future, because we know that Christ is coming, it means we can follow him with urgency and priority in all of our our ways, using our time wisely. In this very letter, later in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul would say this, that for the Christian, here is a privilege that we have. He says, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's how we're to use our time, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord, your labor is not in vain. That's saying this, that for the Christian, because of the return of Christ, because of who Christ is and what he's done, that he is the heir of all things, he is the one who holds all things together, all of creation is is working its way towards him, he's uniting all things back to himself, anything that as Christians we do For the Lord will not be work that's done in vain. It will actually produce something. Not just temporary, but eternal. Do you you see the honor that that is? We all know that most of the work we're engaging in in our lives right now is stuff that maybe in five years probably doesn't matter. Certainly in 200 years when we're gone and the company we're working for is gone, it's certainly not going to matter. But the work for the Lord, he says, your labor is not in vain. It's doing something. It's actually producing eternal fruit. Is that not so much better than just busyness? It's so much better. That's the honor and distinct privilege that you have as a follower of Jesus that you get to engage in. You get to engage in meaningful work. Even the stuff that feels really basic, really elementary, really simple, and not supernatural. The things done in following the Lord Jesus, he says, it'll never be in vain. Ever. And also, if Christ is coming back, it means this, I don't have to be busy for Jesus or for myself. Jesus Christ came and was very busy for my salvation. He accomplished all of the work necessary in order to save me from my sins. He accomplished that. I don't ever have to work and work and work and be busy in order to feel like I need to gain some kind of identity. 
Jesus was busy for my salvation, and now it tells us he sat down at the right hand of God, meaning his work is done. His salvific work is finished. And yet, the Bible also describes Jesus as still working. He's, it's, he says, I'm al- I always live to make intercession for you. Jesus never stops pleading your case. He never stops advocating for you if you're a follower of him. The Psalms also tells us that he who keeps you will not slumber. God doesn't sleep. That's super good news. So guess what? When we turn the lights off and we go to sleep and we finally rest, we stop being busy, we let our guard down, we're very vulnerable, God doesn't stop working. He continues to hold you together. He continues to keep you breathing. He continues to protect you. He continues to keep uh, the earth revolving around the sun. He keeps the right amount of oxygen in the air at all times and seems to wake you up every morning. He doesn't slumber. It is a very spiritual act for us to finally say, sleep. It's us saying, I'm not God. I can't be perpetually busy. But because of who God is and what he's done and who Christ is, I can rest. I don't have to be busy all of the time. And I can use my time for him. I can be available for him. Some of us maybe need to evaluate our calendars and tell our calendars that we're available for Jesus rather than let our calendars tell us if we're available for Jesus. Because Christ is coming again, we we must change how we use our time. We also must change what we are anxious about. This is where he goes into this interesting section here. He says, this is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as as though they had none. Some of you are like, whoa, what is that about? (laughs) Those who mourn as though they weren't mourning. Those who rejoice as though they weren't rejoicing. Those who buy as though they had no goods. Then he says, I want you to be free from anxieties. Here's what he's calling us to. He's calling us to change our attitude toward earthly things. Change our relationship with earthly things. Don't be filled with anxiety and obsession over earthly things. You see, we aren't just burdened with busyness. We're burdened with anxiety. Anxiety is our response to fear and worry. Do any Google search, you'll see that the current generation coming up, Gen Z, is the most anxious generation we've ever seen. It also might be the busiest. Depression on the rise. Suicide on the rise. As a people, we are just deeply burdened with anxiety. One of the major reasons we're burdened with anxiety is we're desperately searching for life and meaning and purpose and we never seem to find it. Paul lists a few of these areas that are usually of great anxiety and worry and obsession and he uses this kind of hyperbolic language to communicate these areas aren't to be absorbing you. They are not the most important thing about your life. He starts with marriage. He says to married couples, live as though you're not married. He's not literally saying, like, leave each other and just live as single people. No, no, no. He's using hyperbolic language to say, your marriage is not the most important thing about you. And so, in a way, you are to live as though that's the case. Because he knows how susceptible we are to make our marriages and our spouses the most important thing ever. Pleasing them is what matters most. Your marriage is not eternal. It isn't. Despite all of the fairy tales we've read that says happily ever after, forever and ever, Jesus says very clearly, in heaven there will be no marriage. The purpose of marriage has been to shadow, to picture for us the love of Christ for his people. In heaven, we don't need the shadow anymore. We have the real thing. Your marriage isn't eternal. It's good. It's God-ordained. It's lean into it, take care of it, tend to it. 
and yet, it's not the most important thing about you. Devotion to the Lord will be the thing that outlasts it. And so he says, those that are single are anxious about pleasing the Lord, and those that are married are anxious about pleasing their spouses. And we get what he's saying, right? And yet at the same time, let's be honest. A lot of you here who are, who are single are actually more anxious about finding a spouse than anxious about pleasing the Lord. Because that can fill our time and our minds and our energy and think, I just got to find this. Paul's saying, let's not obsess over these things. These are not ultimately who you are. It's not most important about who you are. And then he moves on to another subject. He talks about sorrow and joy. Those that are weeping, don't weep anymore. Those that are rejoicing, live as though you're not rejoicing. He's not saying don't cry or don't rejoice. Paul did a lot of that in his life. But he's saying these, don't, these things don't have the final word over you. As Christians, the way we mourn is different. We are sorrowful, and yet we don't grieve the same way as the world. We grieve with hope. So even in our sorrow, we say, this isn't the final word. This doesn't define me. It's not who I am. I don't get lost in my sorrow because I know who Christ is. And on the flip side, I don't get lost in all of my excitement over my happiness in my life because I know those things aren't who I am either. The Bible says that Christians are always sorrowful and yet always rejoicing. And we are simultaneously both because we feel the angst and pull of this world in tension with what's to come. Then he goes to the business world with purchases and business dealings, essentially to say, don't let your career, your purchases, your investments, your retirement consume you. Corinth would have felt this one place of a lot of business, a lot of new startups. And we feel this today in our world. We are consumed with being career-driven. What do we have to show for our lives? Where do we get our status? He says, don't let those things consume you. And he calls us away from the love of things that makes them possess us rather than we possess them. He's saying you can go about your business and your purchases and your dealings and be so consumed and obsessed over them that you don't possess them anymore. They possess you. None of those things are the most important thing in your life because you're a Christian. It doesn't mean those things aren't important. It doesn't mean the Lord doesn't care about those things. That's not what he's saying. But he's saying they are not who you are. And yet each one of those can be a source of deep anxiety and worry in our lives. It can consume us. We all feel this. Paul says, I want you to be free from anxieties. All of us here that were like, amen, Paul. I want that too. I want you to be free from anxieties. But how? What's the answer? There's a million solutions. It's not CBD. It's not yoga. It's not therapy. It's not better work-life balance. It's not more exercise. It's Jesus. He says, I want you to be free from anxieties. But look what he says right before that. For the present form of this world is passing away. All of these things are temporary all of them. He's saying the end of the story has broken into the present. So we got to reevaluate all that we're caring about and being anxious about because we're investing into something that's ultimately almost done. Your marriage won't last. Your joy or your sorrow over present situations, no matter how deep they are, won't last. Your business dealings and your career and your titles and the respect that you've earned will not last. So how does Jesus help? How does he actually give us rest from our anxiety in our worldly dealings? 
Well, first off, he changes what we need from those things. He changes what we need from those things. Meaning this, he provides what we tend to look for in those things. We obsess when we're single about finding a spouse because we long for something. We want companionship, we want friendship, we want love and commitment and sacrifice and intimacy and all of those things. We long for that and yet Jesus says, you don't need to be anxious about finding those things in a spouse because guess what? Once you get married, you're still gonna long for those things because you're not gonna find it fully in that spouse because you were never designed to find it in them, but you find it in me. All that you've been longing for in your sorrow to find hope, to find where is the bottom of this thing so I can hit it. Can I ever come out of this? Jesus says, you find that in me. I take you out of the miry pit and I set your feet on a solid rock and I give you a song to sing. And those of you that in your rejoicing think, man, this is it, this is everything. The Lord wants you to see, actually it's a a bit of a shadow compared to what you have coming for you. It's meant to lift up your gaze and say, this is nice, but I want more, I want more of Christ. And in your business dealings, all of that, man, that affirmation that you want for. Jesus says, I got much better affirmation for you. I have the creator of the universe, the almighty eternal God who wants to speak this word over you. Well done, good and faithful servant. And that's way better than any CEO saying anything to us. He gives us what we're looking for. So we don't have to be anxious about finding it in all of these things. It reminds me of, of the quote from, from Augustine where he said, the, the human heart is restless until it finds its rest in you. He changes what we need from these things. He also takes charge of those things. Remember the story in Matthew chapter 6 where Jesus starts talking about the birds of the air? And he says, they don't labor for anything, and yet the Lord provides for them. You're much more valuable than birds. Because of that, he says, do not be anxious, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. He knows your needs, your desires, your longings. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you. He's saying, you don't need to worry about these things. I know you need them. I'm committed to providing what you need. If you don't believe me by looking at the birds of the air, look to the cross. Because on the cross, I provided your greatest need. I was the sacrifice for your sins. You, you owed a debt to the Lord, your life. You were to receive the wrath of God for your sins. And yet I, Jesus, came in your place and paid the price for your sins. So if you believe me, you're forgiven. I provided the greatest need. And because I provided the greatest need, I won't neglect the lesser needs. I will take care of you. And yet we worry. I heard it said recently, if you can worry, you can meditate. Because what is worrying? just thinking over and over and over again and again and again on the fear, on the doubt, on the anxiousness, on what I don't have, what I need. We just worry, we rehearse it over and over again. That's exactly what meditating is, just on truth. Thinking again and again and again on who God is and what he's done. And he gives us rest. And so we have to change what we're anxious about which means don't just not be anxious about the things of the world, but be anxious about pleasing the Lord. And here's where Paul uses the same word anxious, but uses it in a positive manner. To simply mean invest yourself into this. Care about pleasing the Lord. Seek first the kingdom of God. And when we do, we find peace. And everybody wants peace. Peace. It's only found in Christ. And in Christ, we can genuinely say this, no matter what's going on in our lives, no matter how anxious we feel, no matter how unsecure we feel, in Christ, if you're a Christian, you can genuinely say this, everything's gonna be okay. Everything's gonna be okay. Now, everything might not be okay on earth, 
It might go horribly. It might go worse than you think. You might lose your life. You might lose everything. But in Christ, we know eternally everything's going to be okay. Everything. So there's peace. And I can say, you know what? That's true. I want to please that. I want to please that Jesus. I want to live for him. Because Christ is coming again. We must change how we use our time. We must change what we're anxious about. And lastly, we must change where we devote ourselves. Talking about the married man being anxious about worldly things, he uses this phrase. He says, his interests are divided. His interests are divided. Our hearts are pretty divided in what they are devoted to. He's just simply using marriage as an example of what that can tend to look like. He's not criticizing those that got married for having these cares about how to please your spouse. He's not criticizing them for that. He's just simply observing that marriage imposes demands and responsibilities that can't be neglected. The problem for Paul is is not marriage, but the danger of becoming too distracted in trying to please a spouse. So much so that you become divided. We We have limited resources. We have limited time, limited attention span, limited devotion to commit to something. And the more we have on our plates, the more divided we are. We have lots of interests. We have many devotions. And guess what? Devotions will clash with one another. So what happens when that happens? When your devotion with the Lord clashes with other things, what happens? When the youth sports schedule clashes with Jesus' command to gather with God's people, what happens? When the pressure to please your spouse clashes with Jesus' command to please him, what happens? When the burdens of paying for all the extracurricular things you have going on in your life clashes with Jesus' call to be generous, what happens? Jesus tells us what would happen. Matthew chapter 6, no one can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Your devotions will clash. So which one wins? Paul's just trying to be realistic about how we invest our cares, our hopes, our affections onto things. Because the more we do that, the more our interest becomes divided. And Jesus was so wise to say, you want to know where where your devotion lies? Where do you spend your money? That's what he said. Where the treasure is, your heart will be also. Paul's saying that the unmarried simply have a greater ability to be undivided and devoted to the Lord. Paul rejects marriage for himself because it gives him the freedom to serve the Lord. But the, the, the principle in all of this is that for the Christian, devotion to the Lord is to be the highest value. That's how God's designed it. But it tends not to be the case for us. So Paul says, look to Christ. Look to his return. How does that change it for us? Well, in the return of Christ, what do we see? We see that Christ is undividingly devoted to his bride. When we see who Christ is and what he's done, what do we see in that? We see devotion to his people. And it's unlike any religious system in the world, any ancient God in this context, that God would be devoted to human beings. It's usually the opposite. As long as humans are devoted to the gods, they'll get what they need. In Christianity, the Bible's honest, says, you can't be devoted to me because of your sin, but I will come down to earth and covenant promise myself to you, and I will be devoted to you no matter what. Let 
In the cross, we see the devotion of Christ to save his people. You can't do it, but I've come to do it for you, if you'll believe. In the return of Christ, we see that Jesus is faithful to bring about what he promised. I will do this. I've told you I'll do it. I'm coming again. I will take you to be with me. I will establish a new heaven and a new earth. I'll wipe away every tear, every pain, every sorrow, everything, and it will be joyous. And he's devoted to us in the everyday of our lives as we wait for that day. Constantly attending to us. All of these things are locked in realities for the Christian. And so Paul's saying this, I'm trying to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. That's what he says in verse 35. Which means this, we need to filter everything through. How does this affect my pursuit of Jesus? Everything we want to do in our lives, we need to filter it through that question. How does this affect my pursuit of Christ? We need to know what hinders our devotion and what is like a wind at our back. I don't know if you've ever had the experience of, of running when it's windy outside. Okay, it doesn't matter. You can picture this if you've never run before. <laughs> but when you're running and there's a strong headwind, it slows you down, like actually slows you down. It makes it more difficult to run. You can still run, but it comes at a greater cost and you run slower and you exert more effort. But when you run with a wind at your back, it has the opposite effect. It becomes easier. You run a little bit faster. You don't exert yourself as hard and yet you get further. We need to know the things in our life that we are adding to our plate. Are they dragging us? Are they pushing against us from following Christ? Or are they a wind at our backs saying, yes, go, run, pursue Jesus? Because if he's coming again, that's the most important reality about our lives is that we devote ourselves to him. So we must be willing to ask ourselves, what is pushing against me, hindering me from this, and what is a wind at my back? And we must be willing to cut loose on those things that we can honestly say, yeah, that's not helping at all. It's hindering. Many of us have things in our lives that we're pursuing today that maybe we need to stop and consider. Does this aid my devotion to Christ? My singleness. If I pursue marriage, is that going to aid me in my pursuit of Christ? In my career, in my promotion that I keep pursuing and keep working for with everything that I have, is that going to aid me in my devotion to Christ? Will it be a wind at my back? My career change, will it be a wind at my back? Me moving, will that be a wind at my back? Me adding more commitments and more things and extracurriculars to my calendar, will they be a wind at my back? And the answer might be yes. Paul is not anti putting more things in your life. That's not what he's saying here. He's saying the filter is this. Does it aid my devotion to Christ? If it does, embrace it and run. If it doesn't, cut it loose. Because this is what matters as a Christian. Because Christ is coming again. So let's not be in allegiance to any other agenda, any other pursuit, any other movement, but fiercely to Jesus. And he says in verse 35, I say this to your own benefit. Not to lay a restraint upon you, not to say, you can't do these things, you have to have a really boring life. No, no, no. What The principle I'm laying out before you is for your benefit. To promote good order and secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. Having undivided devotion to the Lord is for your benefit if you're a follower of Jesus. Heck, if you're not a follower of Jesus, it's to your benefit that you surrender and turn to Christ and devote yourself to him. You know, much of my job as a parent, I have learned, is convincing my kids that the things that they don't want to do are actually good for them, and they'll, they'll probably like most of them. And for the longest time, I was trying to convince my oldest son to go on this roller coaster or this ride at Disneyland, and he was just terrified. He, like, wouldn't do it. He's like, Dad, it's going to be the worst. I'm going to get scared. I'm like, no, you're not. 
you can handle it. It's great. You're going to love it. For, for like a full year, I tried to convince him to do this. We went to Disneyland twice in one year. And I was like, let's go. Let's go. Come on. You're ready. No, Dad. No, Dad. No, Dad. And so finally he went to Disneyland with his friends. And he went on the ride that I was trying to get him to go on with me. And he comes back and he loved it. And I'm like, I told you. I told you you would love this. Why didn't you trust me? This is much of what the scriptures are doing. Trying to convince us that what the Lord's calling us to is actually good. And you'll, you'll probably enjoy it. We think that being devoted to Christ is like this loss. Man, I'm not going to get to do all the things I want to do. But when you do it, you'll come to see this. It's better than you thought. And it just keeps getting better. It doesn't mean it's not hard. It's certainly hard. But it's better. It's for your benefit. So church, let's change our relationship with the, with the world. Because Christ is coming again. Let's pray together.